<laughs> so it, it turned out that actually, of all the work that I did on this little pocket spectrum analyzer, uh, the hardest part of the entire project was getting the power button to work. Okay? <laughs> so th this device does not have a hard uh, power switch. It has a soft power button. You can see on the side of the unit here. It's just like one of the many keyboard buttons on the front of it. It's just a multiplexed uh, uh, general purpose I.O. Uh, um, pin pair. Uh, well, in this case, it's between a, a general purpose I.O. pin that is multiplexed with other pins, but it's also between ground, which is, make, is a little bit unique compared to most of the other buttons on this thing. Uh, but the, the trick is uh, you have to have your own code to pull that button, figure out if it's been pressed, and then put the device to sleep in a low power mode. You don't actually you don't actually turn it off completely. You put it to sleep in a low power mode. But before you do that, you have to configure an interrupt so that when the power button gets pushed again, it will wake up, right? Uh, it turns out, so you know, that's all a little bit complicated, but reasonably uh, not, not unexpected, right? Um, it turns out there's a bug in the hardware. Uh, and there's an application note you can find uh, which you must read if you ever decide to write something for this that uses the power button. <laughs> uh, what happens is when you, uh, when you tell the thing to go to sleep, you set some flag somewhere that tells the CPU to go to sleep, uh, and then when it wakes up, it's, it's supposed to clear that flag so it doesn't immediately go back to sleep again forever. <laughs> and that doesn't always work. Sometimes when it wakes up, that flag is in a random state. And it may just continuously start to wake up and say, oh, I'm supposed to go to sleep, and never get a chance to execute any code. Um, and you're screwed. So uh, there's this crazy workaround where you have to, just before, going, just before falling asleep, it, you have to start executing a DMA transfer so that, so, and I didn't even have to do anything with DMA until I started looking at the power button. Uh, you have to execute a DMA transfer so that as soon as it wakes up, the very first thing that happens is that the DMA controller blows away that, that flag <laughs> so it won't go to sleep again. Uh, it's a pain in the ass. And if you ever decide to do this, do yourself a favor, grab my code and, and copy it. <laughs> if you've ever heard the phrase, there's no such thing as a hardware bug, <laughs> it's because when anything is this convoluted, Someone figures out, a real man, not a key sheeter, <laughs> figures out how to uh, write a, um, a workaround for it, such as using the DMA controller. And as soon as they do that, it's no longer necessary to do another silicon spin. And that's the hardware that ships. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're up. Uh, um, so I was in Nuego, Michigan, and I wanted to show off the spectrum analyzer. And if any of you have been to Nuego, Michigan, or rather, 20, 30 miles north of it, um, you'll note that there are no radio signals in Nuego, Michigan. So I got two of these family radios. Uh, uh, they're from different brands, but they're the same type. And they offer 14 channels, um, presumably so that your family and the other ones don't get confused. I'm not quite sure why it needs so many. But these are like long-range walkie-talkies. And I wanted to determine which bands they used but using the spectrum analyzer directly, I wasn't able to get as much detail as I liked. So I used the good fat to actually tap into the memory of Mike's code as it was running and spy on the contents of external RAM. Um, the Chipcat 1110 is an Intel 8051 clone. There are between three and five memories, depending upon how you count. It's not like uh, a PC or other von Neumann device where a pointer refers to a specific location. On this, you have internal RAM, which is 256 bytes long, uh, an 8-bit address. You also have an I.O. region that is the upper half of the internal RAM if referenced directly. Um, so if you use an immediate address, you get one memory, and if you use a, an indirect address, you get another. Um, and then you also have RAM, which is data memory, or external data memory, and uh, flash, which is code memory. And these are all, all separated. A nice thing about Mike's code is that it only needed external RAM. It only needed the, the slower but larger RAM for storing the table to be displayed on the screen. 
So I tapped this. Was that the 15 minute or the 10? Okay, great. Um, so I tapped it and I used a NASA tool called Viewpoints. Um, blue doesn't show up very well, but these columns go pretty high and then the tops are changed to blue. And over here you can see the, uh, the blue lines. And this is a recording of my transmitting on each channel in sequence and then changing the view of the IME to see both channels that are used. Um, but you'll notice that there are only two frequencies that are used. Uh, there's, I think, 915 and 935. So in this 14-channel device, they just use one frequency for the first seven channels and a different frequency for the next seven. And presumably, they have a preamble or a sideband that controls whether or not the receiver will turn on. Um, this also means that it's very easy to broadcast on, say, seven channels at a time or to jam seven channels at a time. Um, so we used Python code earlier uh, in our lecture, and I'm sure a bunch of you are confused. You're thinking, I've read Real Men Don't Program in Pascal. How the hell is Python manlier than Pascal? <laughs> You're thinking that. Be honest. You know? Uh, I'm not going to be offended or anything. Well, We've decided that Python is manly if it has a healthy dose of pointer arithmetic. <laughs> so if you read this code, and I've got an article up in my blog with a simpler form of it, I basically just yank out all of the table, uh, and then I process the C structure by pointer arithmetic within Python. Uh, but this code here is like everything except for the import directives at the beginning. Uh, this is all that you need to use the GoodFet library to dump the end of memory, find the structure of channels being received, parse it, and dump it out as uh, a text file to be pa processed by NASA's tools. And you're up. So a couple months ago, I was watching a television program that it was a crime drama, and there was this, uh, there was this episode where... Uh, uh, a, a woman who ended up being a murder victim, like a month or two before she was murdered, her car was broken into and nothing was stolen. And then, and that was kind of mysterious. And then later on, uh, she was murdered in her house and it was kind of a locked room mystery. Nobody could figure out how the, the attacker got into the house. And as it turned out, the, the resolution was that, that, this, uh, that the murderer, the murderess, uh, had broken into the car in order to clone the garage door opener, and then had free reign of the house, and it, you know was able to get in and out of the house several times over the course of a few weeks, uh, where eventually the murder took place. Um, and I thought, well, gee, how realistic is that? You know, uh, in the in the old days, like two or three decades ago, uh, most garage door openers had a static code. Every time you push the button, it would send the same code every time. And so those were trivial to replay, and if, if, in the, the, um, if in the show the victim had one of those ancient garage door openers, uh, then yeah, it's totally plausible that somebody would be able to execute some kind of a cloning attack like that. Um, but newer garage door openers, and I'm not talking about like new this year, I'm talking about garage door openers that have been around for at least a decade or two. Um, Newer garage door openers use rolling codes, and there are a couple of different chipsets out there that are popular among the manufacturers for remote keyless entry systems for cars and garage doors and everything. Uh, and they do some kind of a uh, some kind of a secure sequence in theory, uh, where like the, the the opener and the and the the opener and the remote are synchronized. They know some either a shared secret or they just know a previous code that was used. And then there's some kind of algorithm where they're both able to generate the next, some kind of a hashing algorithm or something, where they're both able to generate the next co appropriate code in the sequence. And so when you push the garage door opener remote button, the garage door opener receiver checks, its, checks what it receives against the sequence that it produces. And if it's valid, then it opens the door.